backwards uh, in time a little bit because he's for sure you're on the patent at least with the first uh, patent for the technology and a lot of the a lot of the work that this builds off of uh, <laughs> Professor Ring was one of the co-authors on all of the initial papers and, and continuing onwards so, um, so yeah it's really nice to come here and and, and present with you all and so you. You guys do a lot of smoldering in the context of peat fires, and so you look at smoldering as this bad thing that causes a lot of problems. And for us, we look at it and say, well, it's this thing, yeah, for sure, it burns, and it burns really well, so we want to harness, basically, this, these characteristics of smoldering, and we want to use that as part of some industrial process. So a lot of the work uh, that you're going to see is, is really quite similar to what you guys do. We, we're just doing it in a different context. Um, and my goal for today is to give sort of a flavor of, of what it's like to work with the company um, also. So a lot of this work has been in collaboration with um, Savron, and they've commercialized this uh, self-sustained treatment reactor remediation for waste management purposes as well as remediation purposes. Um, and before I jump into all that stuff, I just want to give you a bit of a sense of where I come from in terms of my research group and, and my research background to put it into context and to also I, it's another linkage point because a lot of your work uh, is at the intersection between environmental engineering and, and fire science as well. So we have lots of similarities between our groups. So I just wanted to highlight all of those. Um, yeah, first off. So uh, our group, uh, Research for Subsurface Transport and Remediation, Restore, this is in London, Canada. Uh, it's headed by three supervisors, Dr. Jason Gerhardt, Chris Power, and Peter Robinson. And a lot of our work that we do focuses on looking on the fate and transport of contaminants in the environment, characterizing them within the environment, modeling what they're doing, and as well as looking at remediation solutions for basically cleaning up contaminated sites or, or addressing environmental pollution um, in general. So a lot of the work that we do uh, related to site characterization, so you guys may actually be interested in this because as we know, imaging or, or do, basically do, learning about anything within force media is challenging. Uh, so a lot of geophysical techniques are really nice in, in characterizing porous media. Um, some that we have specialties in include electrical resistivity tomography, um, electromagnetic induction, um, and this ground penetrating radar. And basically, it's a, a lot of these techniques are, are to image the subsurface by using electronic, uh, you're basically measuring the resistivity at different points to, to create a 3D map of what the subsurface looks like based on different uh, differences in resistivity. So that's electrical resistivity tomography anyway. So this may be something that you guys perhaps would be interested in in, in understanding what's happening within a, a some smoldering peat. Uh, some other site characteristic work we do is NAPL migration. So NAPL is non-aqueous phase liquid. It's basically some kind of hazardous organic liquid. Think of uh, some, basically something like gasoline. It doesn't dissolve with water, but it's, it has carcinogenic properties because of the small amounts that do dissolve in the groundwater and make the groundwater toxic. So we want to know what happens when we spill that stuff in the environment, where, where does it go? Um, so there's a lot of work on understanding uh, where it's going. Um, so monitoring apple migration, site remediation, and something interesting has also been using these, electric, uh, these geophysical techniques to look at liners. So we have a lot of projects where we're looking at, there's these landfills, and basically when you make a landfill, you have to make a liner so you don't have the contaminated groundwater leaving a landfill. Uh, but those liners, they're, they're really easy to, you know, a big truck can run over it and accidentally cut it. And these just geophysical techniques can actually find those, those holes in the liner once you basically filled up this landfill. So um, that's been a really interesting application that we've been focusing on recently that I, I just wanted to highlight. And then bait and transport of contaminants. So we live by these enormous lakes and we're concerned about their water quality. So a lot of our work um, is understanding what's happening with contaminants entering the Great Lakes around Ontario. Uh, well, yeah, advanced numerical capabilities. So this is modeling uh, more of the bait and transport within the subsurface. So my supervisor, Dr. Jason Gerhard, this is um, what his specialty is in. And, and interestingly, they. Uh, him and, and Dr. Rain had extended this modeling approach to, to model smoldering propagation um, within within a context of where you have you know this this step would be the fuel and then you're modeling basically burning that that fuel on the subsurface with with effectively the same kind of modeling techniques and then some extra um, tweaks to, to model the smolder spread. So it's um, just to kind of highlight how all these things play together. Um, We've just got this very fancy uh, centrifuge um, in our department. So 
Um, I know there's a lot of buzz around microgravity experiments. Um, I don't know if anyone's interested in high gravity experiments, but if, I, don't, I don't know if we can burn anything in this centrifuge, but if, if you guys have any <laughs> ideas, it's, it's right down the hall. Um, maybe it's sort of one of those things, we'll try it first and then ask for, yeah, beg for forgiveness instead of ask for permission. Um, so anyways, it's, if you guys are interested, we can definitely talk more about this. I just wanted to highlight it because I thought maybe it would be interesting for some more fundamental research. So sorry, about what they use it for? Oh, it's for geo, so we don't use it in our group specifically, but it's used for geotechnical work. So they're looking at, when you, yeah, basically how the, some slope failure problems and, and things like that, where they want to change the gravity for, it's kind of like a, yeah, for geotechnical work, but a little bit more fundamental, I suppose. Yeah. So anyways, like that, this large fancy machine is very expensive and it's near our office. Um, you can put smaller paint. Um, Non-remediation techniques. So this is a lot of what we do uh, in Restore is looking at new ways of, of getting contaminants out of the ground or making them innocuous within the ground, so making them non-toxic where they are. Um, and one of these technologies is based upon smoldering. So I'll just run through them and then we'll focus on the smoldering one. Um, electrokinetics, so this is, you basically have like a, a, this electrical gradient that drives some ions either to deliver some, some reactants to a contaminated zone, and that's gonna react with these contaminants and, and hopefully make them not toxic anymore, or you're actually dragging these contaminants out of the this whatever, maybe a clay region or something, with an electrical gradient. So you're not using a hydraulic gradient anymore like we always do in environmental engineering, now we're using an electrical gradient. So that's been a really interesting project to learn about. Um, as well as we're doing some QCPR, so, uh, Q, QPCR, excuse me, and that's to understand uh, a lot of environmental engineers, they go to these contaminated sites and they want to understand what the microbiological community is doing to basically eat up this, these contaminants. And we can understand what that community looks like by using these um, QPCR techniques, um, basically understanding what different kinds of bacteria are in the ground. Um, and these are some sites. Of, so we do a lot of field work um, in our group. A combination goes from basically doing anything from modeling to lab scale work to, to field work. And you'll see in the, the to what my PhD topic is on specifically, is it's kind of at the interface between what a field is and what a lab is. Um, and do a little bit of work with nanotechnology. So this is injecting some nanoparticles into the ground. And so these particles have very high specific surface areas, so they're very reactive. So if we have these, you know, some particles that can react with a uh, contaminated substance, it's nice to make these particles as, as small as you can um, so that you can get the most effective reactivity. Sorry, really quick question. So when you're doing these tests, do you have to then, you, are you doing them on the surface or are you digging in the ground and then measuring in the ground? Oh yeah, so all, almost all of our work related to site remediation, it's all uh, basically within the ground. So what, what's happening here is they have these wells that are basically in the ground and then they're injecting, in this case for the, um, for the uh, nanoparticles, they're, they're injecting them basically into the subsurface, and then they're measuring the concentration of the nanoparticles and of the stuff they're supposed to be reacting with, the, the contaminants, and they're, they're pulling them out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so all the probes are basically in the ground, like if we're smoldering some peat, we have some probes that are sticking into the peat, it's, it's the same thing, they're just sampling the, yeah. Which is one of, I mean, that's a major challenge with, with, smold, with any kind of force media research, right, is the diagnostic. And it's, of course, multiplied when you get to a field where, and you guys are very familiar with heterogeneities and how that impacts smoldering. It's, it, it governs the problem completely in a natural environment. Uh, yeah, and so there's yeah, so a lot of field trials, and that's, uh, yeah, for us, I mean, we found that's, that's a great way to collaborate with a, with a company, and if they have some extra resources in terms of time, personnel, and they have a site, then it means that you get to try some technology on a site and see what happens in the real world. Um, and it's really hard to get access to that without having strong uh, relationships with some, some kind of companies. Um, and it's been very valuable for them as well. It's basically almost free R&D uh, for them. Um, and so now this is where it gets to what I think is the most exciting part. So this is uh, STAR, so Self-Sustained Tree Tractor Remediation. So STAR is, I'll, I'll talk more about it as the presentation goes on, but STAR was basically born out of, we have uh, these contaminants that are embedded within the ground, um, Basically, since World War II, we've been producing lots of different hydrocarbons for different reasons, and one of the byproducts of making, basically from oil and gas production, is coal tar. So this 
picture over here, this is coal tar mixed with sand. And coal tar is everywhere. Like, to, to give you a sense of the scale of contamination, uh, not with this specifically, but with these kind of hydrocarbons, Every single gas station in the world is effectively a contaminated site. Every gas station has whatever their fuel storage tank is, it's almost expected to leak at some point within the lifetime. So basically, th there's, this stuff is contaminated everywhere. Um, coal tar specifically is really hard to get out of the ground. Uh, effectively, the best practice right now is to dig in them. That's the industry term. So you basically go into some site and you dig up all this coal tar and then you move it to a landfill somewhere. So you're not really addressing, you're not fixing the problem in a way, you're just moving the problem somewhere else. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it was, the story goes, it was uh, my supervisor Jason and Jose over a cup of coffee. They, you know, Jose liked to smolder things. Jason said, I have this big problem with all these contaminants in the ground. And Jose said, oh, well, you know, uh, it'll never work. We need a porous media to have this kind of burning. And Jason said, well, the porous media is everywhere. It's all really... So anyways, over a, a napkin, they had come up with an idea uh, to basically burn these contaminants out of the ground, to smolder them. Um, and, then, uh, and then it began. So it, that's effectively what a company was born out of, Stavron, who we now collaborate with. And I'll, yeah, that's just a very brief history of it. But um, I'll, I'll go through the story a little bit more. But it's, it, it's been a, it's a really interesting project to work on. Um, and out of smoldering, uh, we've been getting a little bit more creative with how we burn things. Um, and so now, in, instead of just for remediation purposes or, or just you know, dealing with this problem of, of waste with, within the ground, we're now dealing with, okay, well, we have all different kinds of wastes um, that, are, that are problematic, and maybe we can smolder them. And maybe through smoldering them, we can get some useful products out of them um, and perhaps energy recovery. So now we're, we're starting to think about smoldering uh, more as like an engineered process that we're you know, starting to, to think about it in a reactor sense instead of going into the environment and, and trying to make it work, because as you guys know, that's really challenging. So now we're going to kind of transition. So this is the background of, of what the research landscape looks like, at least where, where I come from. Um, and now we're going to go to uh, the problem that I'm, I'm most interested in. So uh, this is a picture of a wastewater treatment plant. And wastewater treatment plants are essential for, 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 us, to have a, <laughs> for us to have a very clean environment, basically. Um, so these totally integral parts of, um, of modern civilization, uh, but they are extremely energy intensive. So in North America, at least, which is, I mean, much more energy inefficient than Europe, sadly. Um, but in North America, about 30 to 40% of a municipality's energy goes to wastewater treatment plants. So it's an enormous energy sink uh, within North America. In the United States, that costs $4 billion a year. Um, there's a lot of bits to power pumps. It's a lot of electrical, a lot of electrical power is needed. Um, and so this is a big challenge when we start to imagine what sustainable infrastructure is going to look like in the future. Um, so if we go into a wastewater treatment plant uh, and we start to imagine where, or we start to focus on where most of the resources are being spent, most of it goes into managing the solid byproduct from wastewater treatment plants. So in a wastewater treatment plant, you have different kinds of chemical, biochemical processes, and one of the main uh, parts of a wastewater treatment plant is that you want to basically have your dirty water coming in and then you want to basically have clean water leaving and then your solids in a separate stream because it's really difficult to manage solids so you want to just manage them basically all by themselves. Um, and managing the solid byproduct um, is that's where about 50% of the resources in a wastewater treatment plant is concentrated in. Um, and so that's where we just, what we're focusing on. So this is uh, sewage sludge. Um, I, I'm an experimentalist so I this is really what my life is. <laughs> uh, so sewage sludge, just to characterize it, and it's, it's similar to peat. I mean, it has a lot of the same qualities. It's uh, very high moisture content, very low effective calorific values, consequently. Um, and especially in wastewater treatment plants, sludge management techniques have not experienced much innovation. So with at least managing the liquid streams, there's some new ideas, UV disinfection, for example, which is becoming more popular in North America. But really, there's the, the techniques for managing sludge is they're, they're quite limited, and, and they're all, they share some characteristic where they're energy inefficient. And then yeah, about 50% of the costs in a wastewater treatment plant are spent on sludge. So um, and the other, and the other 50 is the, the, the wood? Uh, effectively, yeah, the 50 is on liquid stuff, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, but the number of processes to manage the solids are, are small compared to, to everything else, because you have all the intake processes, and you have all the uptake for the liquids, and then the sludge is basically just pulling the sludge dewatering it and then burning it or doing something else with it. So those few processes account for a lot of the resources. Um, 
So at least in North America, this is this is what we do with sludge. It, it's a bit different in Europe, um, and depending where you are in Europe. Uh, but a lot of it's used as fertilizer, uh, which is a great way to recycle the nutrients. Um, but stabilizing the material, so making it safe to put on the land because there's viruses and there's pathogens within uh, feces. Um, it's expensive, uh, and there's some risks with emerging contaminants within within uh, sewage sludge as well. Um, incineration is is basically the one, one of the most favored options, especially within Europe. Um, and so one of the big issues is that dewatering, processing the sludge prior to incineration is very expensive. Um, and then the characteristic that all these... Oh, dewatering? Yeah, dewatering. It's not drying. No, no, no. Most, so, for example, the wastewater treatment plant that we get our sample from, they, they use incineration. And they have to dewater their material to, they, you know, squish out the, the moisture as much as possible. Um, till it's about 74% moisture content on a uh, wet mass basis. Yeah. Wait. Oh, on a wet mass basis, yeah. Yeah. Whereas smoldering can burn at higher moisture. This is, and that's the secret sauce. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, so uh, that's the spoiler alert is right there. <laughs> um, and so yeah, and so then we thought, okay, well, all these processes are inefficient. Maybe we maybe we can improve upon them by, by using smoldering combustion. And it's, it's exactly for the reason why Professor Rand, what that Professor Rand had highlighted. Um, so you guys, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on smoldering because I, I know you guys are going to the fundamentals because I know you guys are, you know this stuff. Um, but smoldering, it's flameless, uh, it can be self-sustaining. And from our point of view, it, 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 there's a lot of research on looking at smoldering as a problem, but there's not much research on, on looking at it as a solution. So really, we're really interested in understanding, well, how can we harness smoldering in a way? And how can we manipulate it to, to, have, to be as efficient as possible? Um, <laughs> So here's just a schematic of how um, this process, this STAR process works um, conceptually. So you have some, so for us, I mean, we, our liquid waste and, and our, the, the sewage sludge, it's all not very porous, so it's, it's hard for it to smolder on its own. So to get around that, what we do is we basically mix it within a porous medium, and, and sand for us is uh, the cheapest and, and kind of the easiest. For us, it's, it's the standard at the moment. Um, so we mix up whatever waste we're doing, in a mind case, it would be sewage sludge within sand, and what we're doing is we're heating a localized area of this material up to some ignition temperature, and then we then initiate the smoldering combustion. And once the smoldering combustion has developed to some certain point, we can then remove the heating source, and then the smoldering propagation is going to spread indefinitely as long as basically the heat losses, it's, it's balanced pretty much by the heat losses and the, and the oxygen supply. So as long as you keep blowing, as long as there's fuel, and as long as the heat losses aren't too high, it, it's just going to keep on blowing. Um, so here's some proof of concept experiments. I just wanted to jump out because this is such a famous, this is uh, Professor Rain, I'm sure he's gonna remember this from, so this is smoldering in action. I think it's maybe the only infrared <laughs> kind of imaging of smoldering we have, but that's smoldering starting in the bottom and then it moves up a beaker. So in this case, it wasn't, uh, let's do it one more time. This, case, this is like some coal tar mixed with sand, that coal tar and you can see the smoldering propagation basically moving up. So it ignites in the bottom, moves to the top, and something funny happens at the end, maybe a little bit of flames. What's the time scale on that? Oh, yeah, that's sped up about 50 times. Um, so. Yeah, that is the fascinating thing is that it's not infrared. Oh, that was an infrared. Oh, no, the fascinating okay. thing, it was a cheap camera that we got, a web camera, it was so cheap <laughs> that the spectrum was like off. And actually, it started to see it's more and we were fascinated. What the hell? With our eyes, we could not see it, but the camera I could see it. And that's they were so about to throw the camera away. We were like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know that. I had assumed it was some That's why no one has replicated it, because you have to find this cheap camera that will be gone from got to nowhere. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Oh, I didn't know the story behind it. So it behaves as infrared, but it was not bought as infrared. Oh, that's. Jeez, okay, we have to find that camera. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that beaker video. Okay, so I'll go on you know, maybe a used website or something after this to try to find this camera. Um, yeah, so one of the selling points with this is that once once you if you're able to support a self-sustaining reaction, it, it, it burns quite well. Um, so here we're just in, in the world of environmental engineering, you're always looking at well, how much can you reduce this material, because even small amounts can, can pollute basically large amounts of water. So in the context of coal tar, um, it, it's really important that we can show that we have basically everything that's gone. Um, like it's not 98%, it's not 97 it's it's very, very close to 100%. Um, and so yeah, so this is, in, in just a few pictures, this is where the technology has gone from 
year. I, I would say close to maybe 2009 in the top left hand corner. This would be 2012, no, 2013, I think. And then this is around 2011. I think something, something close to that. So um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's sort of the time scale here. Over about five years, it's gone from lab scale up to, I mean, there's a whole team. I, 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 I know this, this site very well because my, my partner works on that site. And it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, they've been burning for a few years, basically burning this material out of the ground. Very, very challenging work. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is what you know, this molding process looks like in the ground. There's a schematic online that basically shows, uh, yeah, they take the well, they, they basically drill in, they heat up some small area, and then they're able to start a smoldering propagation. They have some thermocouples drilled into the ground so they can tell how far it's going. They have some emissions collection equipment so they can say like, okay, where the smoldering still going, when it looks like it's done. And then basically they'll, be, they'll drill in, they'll burn a little bit, they'll take their stuff out, and they'll go to another spot, drill down, burn a bit, and then move to another spot. So they're always burning these kind of spheres um, uh, of, of material. Uh, and this is what, and so this was the, the, the prototype, uh, the, the field scale test that, that was successful. This is all in New Jersey, by the way. Very contaminated place. You <laughs> mean um, the site? Pardon me? The, the, the site. Yes. No, not the state, no? Oh, well, actually, I, <laughs> say, I the site is extremely contaminated, but large areas of New Jersey. Well, at least around uh, whatever that shipping yard is, every site is, is a mess. Um, yeah, they've had a lot of, yeah, just because of the industrial activity there, and they're, they were all following the same practices, which was dig a hole, put your crap in the hole, and, and we don't line it. This was just standard practice in the 1960s and 70s. It was no leaks, it was like, we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And their, their favorite lagoons, so their favorite holes, were the holes where basically you put some stuff in, and then after a few days, the stuff is gone. So you put more stuff in, and then after a few days, the stuff is gone. So when you start to characterize the sites, you see it's like, a, yeah, it, it's a patchwork of, of things like that, where you, you had a lagoon there, and you can start, well, once you start to poke around, you can start to see where this stuff had, had transported to. Um, and this is, yeah, so this is the site that we had worked at, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is, so yeah, STAR, again, following this narrative, had started as a remediation technique, trying to clean up the subsurface and, and these contaminated areas, and now it's turning into some kind of waste management technique. Thermal processing in general. Um, so I, I feel like I've actually talked a lot about STAR, but now I'll talk a little bit about the publications because maybe this will be interesting for you guys. Um, but yeah, so uh, many of them are actually famous to co-author on. Um, it started with the scale up, basically a proof of concept that shows, oh yes, this idea works. Um, then there was some modeling that was done uh, that basically had extended to show how this smoldering can, can propagate and, and some, some nice assumptions that can go along with, with how we smolder to simplify the problem. Uh, there was a scale up, um, a larger scale up, and uh, then we showed that we can smolder feces, um, and then, uh, yeah, this is another modeling study, uh, Professor Rank can certainly talk more about this, but this is basically, it shows that, yeah, we can model it in one direction, we can also model it in two directions, and, and the propagation matched the experiments really nicely. Um, we found that we can smolder sewage sludge in addition to feces and all sorts of contaminants and other stuff. And the process can be continuous relatively easily. Uh, there's this problem with uh, liquid mobility. So if you have some, some whatever material burning, you, you have some transient heat. There's transient heat transfer and mass transfer zones within the smoldering front, as, as you guys within the smoldering community are aware of. Uh, and those can have these really strange problems that are occurring, where there's this like a quasi superadiabatic combustion. In, uh, in Moore's work, which is really, really um, bad because it's, it's a safety hazard, but it was neat. Um, and then, yeah, and then effectively, uh, Marco from our group has been working on this, really a, a, a harmonized conceptual model of how we smolder and, and developing kind of this concept of a global energy balance that, that we now use basically to characterize a lot of experiments. So I'll talk at the end of how we tie all that together. Um, but. The main point here, the, this technology had started as remediation, now turning to waste management. And so one of the key research questions we have is, is how can we man transition this technology best at, as a waste management technique? So going back to my problem, which is in a wastewater treatment plant, we, we started off with, we want to explore, okay, you know, what, what happens when we start to smolder in larger reactors? So there was 
when we had started, there was no systematic study that had basically changed the reactor scale, and then you maybe have some fundamental physics descriptions, and we, we just didn't have that. There were a lot of ad hoc studies that we were trying to follow on, so we decided, well, maybe this is a good opportunity. Um, it also served to be the pre-commercial study for introducing stars, star into a wastewater treatment plant. So this is uh, valuable for our industry partner. They, they needed to basically try it out before they can start selling it. Uh, that's a fair way to look at that. Um, yeah, and this is interesting to understand the relation between reactor size and heat retention. Um, so you can intuitive, intuitively understand you have a small cup of hot water versus a bathtub of hot water. Um, the, the small cup of hot water is going to cool down much faster. Um, so we just wanted to have some some ways to describe that relationship. Um, and I mean, generally, we wanted to learn more about how to smolder super cells. Um, so it's you know learning from you guys in the peat world, and then going to us. It's there's uh, there's certainly a lot of similarities, but there there is a lot that we we just don't know. Um, so it's just a general good time to to learn some more. So this is where a lot of our work had started um, at the lab scale. So this is our little lab reactor. It's just you know that high. And then so we did 32 experiments, and then we found that we could smolder up to 80% moisture content um, by uh, sewer sludge. And to give you a sense, at uh, the local wastewater treatment plant, when they incinerate this, and they're using a highly optimized fluidized bed incinerator, they can they can burn 74% moisture content. So for us, well, we can handle 1.5 times more than than the typical incinerator. Bed. So that's already a really interesting result, and that was enough for us to basically justify a scale-up study. Um, and so the scale-up study was in collaboration with our industry partners and a consortium that had funded wastewater treatment technologies. And so we started, we went from our lab reactor to moving up into uh, this uh, drum sized reactor, and then we ran some experiments in this enormous, that's basically a three meter tall beast. Um, but today, so, as you guys know, and which is kind of implicit within a, a topic like this, uh, when you scale up, there's all different kinds of challenges. And when you challenge, when your scale increases, your challenges increase exponentially. Um, and so, <laughs> for that reason, I just wanted to focus a little bit on on some of the data that we've got from our lab and our, our ISR experiments, and then we'll leave the the strange things that happened in that reactor for for another day. Um, so, project overview, just to give you a sense of what the scale of this project was. Uh, so it was two years and, and half a million dollars of cash. Uh, we, so yeah, we had developed a space for large experiments. Uh, we trained a large team of really, really talented undergraduate students. So this kind of work, it, it just doesn't happen with one person. Um, and we completed a lot of experiments. Uh, one of the issues is it's like uh, with Biggie Small said, more money, more problems. Kind of like the same thing. You have more experiments, you have more, more problems. It's good, good problem set. Um, so I'm sure we'll talk about this more afterwards, but this is our experimental setup. I, I know it looks like a rat's nest, but what, we, what we're doing here is we take our sewage sledge, we're mixing it up with some sand, and then we're packing into this about an oil drum sized reactor. And what we're doing is we're, we're basically, so we have a convective heater over here, and then we're starting ignition down at the bottom here, and, and the propagation, uh, goes basically up through this reactor in a quasi-one-dimensional way. Um, and we're measuring the mass loss rate of time. The whole system's on a mass balance. Uh, we have temperature measurements throughout space and time. Um, we have pressure measurements just up along the center ax central axis. Uh, and then we are measuring the emissions downstream, limited to uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and then we don't really produce, in these experiments, methane, but, and, but we do have a lot of hydrocarbons that are released. So coming through, so they're, they're stuck to, you know, the, the carbon atoms stuck to whatever hydrocarbon molecule. So we don't have them well speciated, but we have a sense of, of how much we can use. Um, and then we did, so one part of this, um, this program, which maybe you guys would be interested in, is that we had done some detailed chemical analyses. So we were sampling for hazardous VOCs, um, as dictated by the environmental en engineering industry, um, and as well as dioxins and furans. So maybe this is something that you guys would be interested in. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but very happy to talk more um, afterwards, let you know what we've been learning about. Um, and just to give you a visual sense of what this looks like, on the top there, this is our sewage sludge and sand mix. Um, and then this is what it looks like in the lab after we burn it, and this is what it looks like in the large scale reactor after burning it. So it's it, basically the, the same thing is happening, uh, just visually, so our first uh, sense. And kind of our second sense is I just wanted to visualize uh, 
uh, what the temperature of the central axis of both reactors looks like to the prime. And what we're doing here is we're non-dimensionalizing the experiments uh, to a single zero to one time, where zero is when the reaction ignites, and one is when the reaction ends, leaves the reactor. Um, and basically, the, the key point here is that I just want to highlight that the reaction kind of, it basically looks the same between the two experiments. Um, it, Relative, it propagates relatively the same way, uh, but when we non-dimensionalize it, at least in this fashion, we don't really see um, the important differences between the, what's happening in each scale. So the, e, the ISR is the monster, right? The amazing piece. Oh, I'm sorry, the ISR is the, the oil drum size one. Oh, it's the one, okay. Yeah, so the monster one has, has so many strange things happening in, oh, no, I won't present that data today. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is one thing, I saw the ISR was pulsating. And the lab one was not pulsating. Ah, this is, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, you're 100% right. So this is, uh, this ties into one of the effects that we've been trying to learn more about, uh, which is there seems to be some interaction between the smoldering and the drying front in these experiments. And it's, some, it's one of these kind of chaotic things that we haven't, we, we don't have a very sophisticated. But it is not, because I saw that you have convective heating, right? Oh, yeah. And you will, you might have a pressure built up, so it's not a response of your ignition or your supply of oxygen. With I think so, because we see it, because we have the same ignition method for smoldering different fuels, and we don't see this effect. So you control flow, and you don't see that pulsation at the source. Ah, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and we have the pressure transducers. Yeah. So we don't we don't see those fluctuations within okay. the pressure. It seems to be within the temperature profiles. Only. Could it be um, mobilization of the liquid, or it? Well, it could be, but it, well, I. If we were burning a strict liquid, the sewage sludge really is like a semi-solid, so it doesn't it doesn't really flow. It's like um, it's it's like a pound cake or something. So it's we've, we've never seen in in Hazelab, we've never seen pulsating and smoldering, but there is a group in Norway oh. who have seen pulsating and smoldering oh, okay. with biomass, and it's it's fascinating. Precisely when they were trying to suppress. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's, be, yeah. They, you can. I'm, I'm happy to send you to their paper. Um, it seems to be a critical phenomena when you are close to extinction. Yeah. Not when you are fully going on. Yeah. yeah. This is really interesting because when we started all these experiments, I didn't go into this too deeply, but we started at conditions that we had basically thought were very robust. Um, and then when we, we came to the, this reactor, we found that we had really strange, kind of like unpredictable extinction events happening. And so what our thought of what was robust yeah. wasn't really the same as when we went to into these reactors. So this pulsating effect, I think is, it may be similar to what we're seeing. I'll, I'll send it to you, it's, it's Ragni, for those of you who know Ragni in Norway. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I, I think it's, yeah, it's, we're seeing some, maybe something similar by the sounds of what they were describing. But so, I mean, you, obviously you suffer um, the consequences, but it's fascinating to observe yes. pulsating smoldering. Right. You, saw, you, you suffer it because you don't know what it is and you have to explain it everything, but it's, uh, don't forget that it's, but it's something quite interesting. Uh, this is something that Jason and I go back and forth on because I want to explain everything. And he says, no, this is interesting. We have learned something new today. Uh, but for me, I get nervous if I <laughs> can't say what's going on. So um, as a consequence of that, I, I, I am glossing over a lot of the data that we have. But I'm happy to talk about more of this stuff in detail with you guys at, at any time. Um, is it, actually, this is misnamed. It's not temperatures. Now we're going to look at mass loss. Um, so what we have here, so I just wanted to give you just a sense of what the mass loss, the global mass loss in this process looks like. So this is from a lab experiment, uh, and on this topic of pulsating, uh, this is from our ISR experiment. So yeah, I mean this this idea of pulsating, I mean you can and you can see it within the mass loss perhaps as well. So this no, is very little. Mass loss is fine. Yeah, very, yeah, the mass loss is quite smooth. Yeah, it's a, it can be much more. Well, we found that if we had been a little bit more careful with how we had basically set up our experiment, how we had packed the column, then we saw these like chaotic temperature effects had, had attenuated. And, and the mass loss, weird stuff had attenuated as well. Um, so that has been kind of forming what we think is going on. Um, but yeah, generally, the, I had thought the same thing as Professor Rain, where I thought they looked pretty much the same. So again, I should explain the axes here. Um, again, zero to one is a non-dimensional time, and then the mass is also non-dimensionalized. So when it goes to negative one, if all the smolderable mass in the system is, is effectively gone. So in, in our case, the more, more or less the same thing's happening between these two experiments. Um, and most of the mass is, is gone, which is, which is good, because in our case, for waste management people, we don't want to lose 
waste in there. Um, and I wanted to present this, and this thing's really interesting. So this is now, so we have thermocouples within space and time. So I wanted to give you guys a sense of what this looks like, you know, because I've been trying these one-dimensional plots, and, and now this is what the, the direction looks like when we try to imagine, try to look at all of it. So basically, this is the center of the column, very, very hot, and the walls are much cooler. And you see that we have, we have these shapes, we have these shapes developing. Um, and that's, we've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what is happening with the, um, these temperature profiles um, for a few reasons. One is because this relates directly to how much energy storage we have in our system. Um, and two, because we're looking at the interplay between like the thermophysical properties in the system changing um, and, and how that is basically affecting the flow pattern uh, within our, within our uh, column. Just I want to highlight that that was experimental data. That's experimental data, yeah. Yeah, because it is so unusual that some people, if they're not paying attention, they might think it's a modeling. Uh, it's oh, yeah, I should, you're right. I should have, yeah, should have highlighted this. It's just visualized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, this experiment, this one was with uh, just with granular activated carbon, not with sewage sludge. Um, we had instrumented it a little bit more carefully so we could we can get a better sense of what, what the temperature changes are across the radius of the column, especially. That was Celsius. Pardon me. The temperature was Celsius. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't describe, I didn't describe anything. Yeah, this is Celsius. So you can tell this is a very hot reaction. Yeah, yeah. So this is GAC. Um, this was at, I think it was 4%. I, I could look at the values, but it would, uh, yeah, about the peak temperatures that we'd expect from laboratory experiments. And actually, with the GAC, is a really nice experiment with because you can do like, a, you can just do like a, like adiabatic flame temperature kind of calculation with the GAC and just assume it's all carbon and your, your peak temperature is relatively close to, to what you can say. So that's what the Bout group in, in France had been doing. So we had kind of copied their ideas. Sorry, that's the, just say that again. Oh, the, the French group, um, the paper was Bout et al. Oh, in, yeah, yeah, in South. Yes, I think Salvador, maybe that's the supervisor there. Uh, yeah, yeah, in Toulouse. The Toulouse. former <laughs> supervisor of my Yes, yeah, uh, yeah for, uh, I, I believe Marcio. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The small world, the smoldering world is so small. We all know each other. Um, and so and I just wanted to highlight this as well. So this is uh, from Marco's uh, most recent publication. Uh, and this is all looking at uh, the energy balance within a smoldering system. And the, we're really following his methodology for how we're describing our experiments. So when I presented all these, uh, especially the last plot with the, the basically the temperature evolving in space and time, uh, we're, we're effectively using Marco's methodology to back out, well, what does that mean in terms of the system energy efficiency? And, and this, that's becoming one of the kind of optimization parameters um, that the industry, uh, our industry partner is interested in. Um, so yeah, I, that, I just wanted to give you guys a really high level summary of the kind of stuff that we're doing. Um, and just to kind of, the overarching thing, we've, we've done a lot of experiments and it certainly wasn't just me, there's lots of people involved. Um, actually, I probably asked every single person in that photo for help, so this is a combination of our academic industry partners and as well as our, some of our, half of our summer students basically are in this photo. Um, and, and I've bothered all of them. Um, and, and I didn't present on this today because it's really still in a raw format, but over the last few months, we've, because as you guys know, when you have experimental program, it, it can be very rigorous, it can be very time consuming. Um, we've now had the time where we're going back and we're using some fundamental care, some fundamental descriptions to, to describe what's happening, especially within the, the heat loss region, within the cooling behind the smoldering front. Um, and I'm really happy to talk about more of that if you're, if you're interested. Um, and thank you very much, um, big project. Lots of lots of things to recognize, but most importantly are all the summer students. They had put up with a lot of sweat, and you know what our experimental work is. So, um, yeah, they deserve the most recognition. So, thank you guys very much.